Good afternoon, one and all. It's good to see you. Thank you, especially if you're an OCL A-level P student. You've got two days to go before your paper one, but you're here studying with us for paper three. So big respect to you for that. We're kind of anticipating this show will go a bit better on demand than it will live, so we'll see what happens. But we're here. We're going to deliver, hopefully, a really, really good show for you this afternoon. I have Marta to my right, as always, my right-hand person, confidant, Hello. business partner, the lot. Uh, and it's our last show of 20, Marta. Yes. How's it been? It's been epic, hasn't it? It's, it's emotional, it's emotional. It's emotional. Marta, how do these youngsters uh, contact us during the show today? They can contact us through the little chat icon on the Hub page. Uh, of course, if they are watching live, if they are watching on YouTube. We'll be in Hawaii there, by then. Then we won't be there, yeah. <laughs> we won't be there. Exactly. So do do post a, a message if, if it's of interest and you've got something to ask us, we'll answer it for you. Okay, so it's there. If you're watching on YouTube, you just click in the description to the hub page, just the link in the description, and it'll bring you to a place where you can ask us a chat, uh, you ask us a question on the chat. Okay, so that's there for you. Can I remind you that you should have your notes pages in front of you again, available on the hub page, your practice questions, which hopefully you've attempted. Um, you should have somewhere near you as well, your mark schemes and your model answers. They're there to resource this session. Now, one thing I would say to you is beginning to get feedback from the students who just did their GCSE PE paper through their, with the A, EI material covered this afternoon and they were saying that the practice papers they did and the model answers were particularly helpful to them where those topics came up and of course they knew they were going to come up having those model answers those phrasings those terms in their mind really bolstered them and how they could answer that question now we don't know how that's going to turn out in marks who knows but that's great feedback to be getting and we'd really endorse that can I ask a favor in return for our time and our effort in putting these sessions together can you subscribe to the YouTube channel please and can you please hit like on this particular uh, this particular publication, this particular video and live show, it really helps us and we appreciate you doing that. Of course, it costs you guys nothing, it's just a gesture and it would be great if you could do that. Um, finally, we think we're going to run through the whole show in one this afternoon. We reckon it's going to be between 35 and 40 minutes, there or thereabouts. We're going to run through it as one single piece and have a nice, tidy, organised session covering everything from drugs to commercialisation to technology. We're going to cover all of that and we'll go from the start to the end and push all the way through. We'll do a Q&A at the end. So we should be together for around about 45 minutes, something like that. Marta, anything that these fine folk need to be aware of before we uh, carry on, before we get on with it? No. Happy? I think that's it. Yeah. Okay, so let me make the transfer over to the canvas, hopefully, and I shall be back with you just a moment with a little bit of teaching about drugs. Here we go. So drugs and doping in sport, it's a major issue in the modern sporting world. Therefore, it's very contemporary. Therefore, we study it in contemporary issues. Our first job is to be able to differentiate between supplements which are legal and drugs which are, or doping methods that are illegal. So let's go to legal first of all. We're talking about creatine, usually for taking the form of creatine monohydrate. We're talking about colostrum, which is the first milk that a mother produces uh, for its child, very thick and sticky substance. We're talking about vitamin supplements, protein supplements. These are all completely legal in sport and can be used to enhance or to moderate or to improve the quality of training performance. They're regulated, therefore the substances tend to be pure because they're coming from a proper pharmaceutical lab, therefore we have a regulated industry. They do not involve breaking the law, unlike here, and we're not just talking about sporting laws here, we're talking about laws themselves, and they're not banned and do not incur punishment. So you can even describe the use of these as quite functional. You know, we could, you know, creatine for example, I mean there's some question marks around health, but Basically, it's legal. It's used very extensively in professional sports, especially in games. But we've also got illegal drugs and, and um, doping methodologies. Steroids, narcotic analgesics for pain relief, peptide hormones such as EPO or HGH. Let me write those in as examples. EPO, erythropoietin, HGH, human growth hormone. These are examples of peptide hormones. They are unregulated. They may cause health issues. Now, there's two reasons they may co cause health issues. They may be tainted with other substances because they're not regulated. But the other problem we have is that athletes take huge doses. Athletes by nature are risk takers uh, and they will take risks with their health, health when they're in what we call the win at all cost method, uh, mentality which we'll come back to in a second and of course can lead to bans and punishments and obviously don't um, forget as I said before that health issue which can be really really significant. Now what, what are the reasons why an athlete would go about taking a performance enhancing drug? Why would they break the law in this way? Now I would strongly argue that by a million miles this is the most important reason. Ultimately, why would an athlete doing this? They're a hyper-competitive individual. They are there to win because that is the modern notion of sport. Therefore, they develop a win-at-all-cost mentality. Can I stress, this is not the same as the win ethic. 
The win ethic, we could broadly summarise it as doing anything within the rules, gamesmanship included, to win in our contest. Win at all costs includes breaking the rules. It includes cheating, doping, violence, aggression. It involves things that we sh are ultimately dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. And doping is an excellent example of that dysfunction. People do it for rewards and fame, fortune, okay? So that kind of status, that wealth, that career path. And I guess we can understand that to a degree because we're sort of driven quite materially. And I want to quote Madonna directly, but you know, we're living in a material world, broadly speaking. And we can also develop pressure from a coach. Now, of course, that pressure from a coach could be because that coach is under pressure. could be because the coach wants rewards, fame, fortune, because they want to increase the chance of winning, because they have the win at all cost mentality. These are interlinked points. There's the other point, which is everyone does it. It's the culture. I'm going to mention cycling in the 90s. Cycling in the 90s, there's an eye in there. Cycling in the 90s had drugs as absolutely endemic. Um, you can make a pretty bold statement that all or almost all athletes were doping at the very, very top level. Now, again, I'm sure someone could disprove that, but that's why I'm saying almost all. Therefore, people do it because they've got no choice. I, I think about the example of Frankie Andreu. Now, you might not know who I'm talking about with Frankie Andreu, but he is a cyclist who uh, rode with Armstrong and refused, off, um, some people argue, because of uh, his wife's opinion on this as well, that he would not dope and he lost his place in the team. He needed to do it because it was the culture. He needed to do it to get on that level playing field. The other thing is if you believe everyone else is cheating in sport and you want to win in that sport, what are you going to do? I guess you're going to go to that mentality, right? And it's easy for us to say, oh, I wouldn't do that. But I would just ask the question of really, when your career depended on it, when there was no other way as far as you could perceive, do we honestly all tell ourselves that we wouldn't? Now, I think I'd like to believe I wouldn't. But in every person, there's good and bad. Is that at the heart of the doping lesson? Inside every person, there's good and bad. There's right and wrong. How do we culture and educate towards the right? Oof, that got philosophical, didn't it? But it's actually an interesting point. Positive psychological effects. And of course, you might also if you want to come across the placebo effect here. Now, obviously, if we're taking a drug, it's not placebo by definition. But... You've even got like the think. Oops, didn't mean that to buzz. Think about someone who is um, taking drugs and risking their health. They might do this. Um, they might do this because you know they, they might develop that psychological benefit as well. Just silence whatever it was that was beeping in the background. Apologies for that, folks. Okay, <laughs> everything else is now beeping at me. So consequences of drugs in sport and drugs and doping. What have we got? So we must differentiate between consequences for society, for sport, and for performers. So let's go for society. I'm so sorry about the beeping. Consequences for society. Negative role modeling. We've got sport loses respect. We can also throw in the word reputation. I mean, that's really a problem, isn't it? People have fewer distractions by sport. So we start to lose respect for sport. So we're distracted less by sport. People invest less time in sport as a tax implication. So if we stop, for example, following Premier League football because it's, it's, it's full of doping, that's going to have a tax implication. Now, I'm not suggesting to Premier League football is, not all my knowledge, it isn't. But imagine. Fewer people take up sport, meaning people are less healthy. Loss of patriotism if an Olympic athlete tests positive. Loads of examples of this. Now... I should be clear here, I'm going to use the example of Bradley Wiggins. Bradley Wiggins has never tested positive um, for an illegal substance, to my knowledge. Um, but there's question marks over the, the cleanness of his riding and therefore the cleanness of his Tour de France and Olympic medals and so on. So that's a real issue, right? And you've got, whether, assuming he didn't do that, for a second, you feel sorry for that person who's tainted in that way. Or if he did, then obviously that's on him. Uh, national scandal and shame, I sort of touched on that a moment ago. Now, we've also got consequences of the sport, loss of sponsors, loss of participants, loss of supporters, negative image, negative coverage, pressure to identify and deal with teach. By the way, this is expensive. Anti-doping is a huge investment, which is perhaps why it's not been done. An investment in detection and monitoring of PEDS, as we've just mentioned there. Now, to finish this off, what are the consequences for performers? They're going to lose their personal sponsors. They're going to be banned, usually two years, but it can be life. Loss of respect, they're considered a cheat, they're shamed, their family members get hurt, not necessarily physically, but certainly emotionally. Think about things like online abuse and press, and press intrusion into their lives. Now, you can make an argument and say, well, they brought it on themselves, but I want to go back to this point here. I don't want to be sort of a soft touch, but what if it was the culture? What if 
they kind of had no choice. It's, an, it's there are grey areas, right? Again, I don't want anyone to think I'm endorse, endorsing the use of performance enhancing drugs. I'm absolutely not, but I think we've got to look at it in a real world type scenario. Question, in 2019, five cross country skiers were arrested in Austria for blood doping prior to competing in the world championships. Describe the possible side effects of blood doping. So this is specific to blood doping, <laughs> which I've um, done there. So we've got increased blood viscosity, we've got pulmonary embolism. This, this is about thickening of the blood. Heart attack, stroke, infection by transfusion. Okay, so we've got that one there. Next question. Out of competition testing is used increasingly with professional athletes. Describe two other strategies that could be used to reduce doping in sport. So we've got to take our reasons and switch them here. More severe bans, we can educate people about fairness and we can change the culture. They come from our reasons for participating in doping, okay? So that's where we take that from. That's they're the read the ways in which we can address this. Now, we're gonna move on to commercialization and media here, folks. Now. Obviously, for us, we want to focus entirely on OCR's requirements of us for the A-level, of course, do. But the one thing I wanted to mention to you folks, I mean, be aware, the commercialization, in my opinion, across GCSEs and A-levels and PE this summer are going to be the most examined topic, as far as I can tell. They're listed on every AEI. They're covering they're covered in every paper. So it really is a key theme. I'm sort of saying that for the teachers, really, because we would need to make sure that we're good at this. So what has led to commercialization? What has led to this sort of, and we'll come to the golden triangle in a minute, but what's led to this? So more public interest, more spectatorship, more media coverage, higher standards, make it more entertaining, more advertising, more sponsorship. That's Those are the factors that have led to commercialization of sport. This is where we have taken our traditional model of sport, and for these factors, we have left this behind. So let's go a little bit further. What's the impact of that commercialization on individual sports? Now, of course, when we look at impact, we're looking at the positive and the negative. Therefore, we are here to evaluate we are here to evaluate. So first of all, positives. We've got increased income from media companies on the sport. Premier League football, great example. Greater capacity to invest in the future, get involved with grassroots. Uh, better sales of sponsorship, you get a global audience. You move to a wider international market. Now notice these are all business advantages, right? Now remember, we're talking about sport and entertainment and movement. Is it right that it's focused there? We get better viewing figures, we get bigger international interest, we get grassroots participation, fantastic. And sport modernizes to maintain the audience. This could be things like rule changes, making things more spectacular, better technology, better equipment. But there's a there's a there's a loss, there's a deficit. Sport becomes a secondary factor and that commercial activity is primary. We might have change of start times, we might lose our tradition. The pressure from the sponsors comes too high, and this takes a lot of time. Um, from the focus, which arguably should be the sport. Rules might need to change to suit TV audience. Cricket, an excellent example. Badminton, an excellent example. Fun, a netball have changed scoring rules in numerous competitions as well to suit the TV audience. Funding only available for a few sports like football and cricket. So we can say that this is relatively exclusive, folks. This commercialization only benefits a small number of sports. And it certainly seems to benefit far less women's sport and Paralympic sport and non-mainstream sport. So there's some deficits there. Lack of income, oh, there you go, minority and Paralympic, exactly what I said. Scandals are very public and can damage reputation. If something goes wrong, everyone sees that thing. Okay, so if someone does something disgusting or despicable, everyone gets to see that. Now, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but of course the reputation gets damaged. Men's sport is backed more than women's. You might want to ask the question why. I've got some interesting possible answers to that question. If we get a chance later, maybe I'll answer it on the camera. Um, commercialization can reinforce stereotypes around a sport. So it can also challenge stereotypes. But stereotypes can certainly be reinforced because media will focus on sort of the sensationalist, power, strength, impressive type um, performances. Now, we also need to be considering what commercialization does to performers. Let's go through that. So let's have a look here. More revenue to the individual. Sport becomes their career. They can train full time. These are good things, right? They make more money, fair play. They raise their profile and become maybe even household names. Let me write that in. People can become household names. Think Farah, think Ennis Hill, think Rashford, think, um, I can't think of any more sports people, which is weird. Um, they become a role model. Their being a role model provides other commercial opportunities. They get more sponsorship and they get celebrity status, household names, as I said before, but there are negatives for the performer. There's also only popular sports. So again, it's relatively exclusive, only 
the mainstream, often men's sport, get this, provide media pressure, the pressure on the performer themselves, pressure from sponsors. Everything they do is highlighted. It can be intrusive. They might not be able to do normal things such as pop to shops. And they maybe don't want to, but it's, it's a restriction. Performances are analyzed in fine detail. The analysis is non-stop. Um, <laughs> it's non-stop. <laughs> May People may receive insults and aggression via social media. Let's just call that abuse. It can even lead into things like racism and sexism and misogyny. Things we do not want in our world. Demand to compete relentlessly. Like no time to rest, no time to recuperate, no time to recover from injury. Demand to put the sport above one's own health. And sponsorship can be removed, especially if we're losing or especially if we're deviant. You know, if somebody gets outed for doping, for example, they're obviously going to lose their sponsorship so that's the effect on the performer and distinguish those effects on the performer to the sport now let's keep going we're now talking about the spectators now i know this is a hard slot guys i know there's a lot of detail here but that is what we're here for so i don't apologize for it we must get this detail in these different sectors so for spectators they see more they got matches every day more choice they got access to international competition if you like football you can watch the argentinian league the italian league the south african league the australian league the j league in japan they can, you can watch anything Increased revenue for sport improves the quality of stadium. The visiting experience becomes better. Full-time athletes perform a higher standard, makes it more exciting. New versions of the sport are better to watch. Think about the 100 or the T20 in cricket. Stories and narratives are more available when performers are there to entertain. Okay, So we get this sort of even in-between matches kind of entertainment. But we lose tradition. We change format. Increase in demand can raise ticket prices. Go up. Okay, nobody wants that if you've got to buy the bloody things. <laughs> sports lose their local identities. Folks, um, when we, if you did the Sports Society session with me, you know we talk about the emergence and evolution of modern day sport. It's got a traditional amateur nature. It's got a traditional local identity. Football spectatorship, athletics, rugby league developed in the town and the locality. People represented the pride of their city. Those people that represent now are not from that city. Now, I've got no comment to make on that, but it's different. I, I love watching football, for example. I've watched Man City win the league recently. A couple, you've got, I think I've got one local player, I think Foden, right? And everyone else is effectively bought in. That's different. I'm not saying it's better or worse, but it's different. Fan becomes a consumer. This is really important. We're no longer there as, as a fan, as a heart that's love of that club or that team or that sport, whatever. We're there to be sold to. And the connection between the fans and athletes can be lost. Although I would say social media is probably improved aspects of this so we can challenge that idea and negative behavior is very public and can have an impact on spectators as we know and then on society folks and i think we've this is the last one i'm just trying to remember if we had to do officials but on society um, more money has been invested by media and sponsors so that's good right i mean that means there's more money in our economy in our society sports invest in grassroots therefore people become more active ngbs target children with less income i mean in a positive sense to try and get them active and engaging popular sports now have the money to nurture athletes from all classes good talented athletes from lower classes might receive sponsorship that might not have been possible before without the commercialization more media coverage exposed people of all class so this is a real class factor right so people of <laughs> people of different class can have relatively equal opportunities providing aspirations Lower class young people have more role models and they can inspire young people to participate. This is good stuff, right? For So for our actual society, the, the impact of commercialization is pretty positive, but the sport's still presented in stereotypical ways. Class, gender, age barriers are not being broken. Media coverage is not fair. Again, we could certainly say it's disproportionate towards men, towards certain activities, towards... Uh, able-bodiedness not sure what the exact term to use at the moment is for that but you know what I mean richer sports get all the opportunity sponsors only interested in highest level of exposure so what you might sort of think about the levels just below the top level and certainly amateur level this is not getting that kind of media exposure sponsors have little commercial interest in minority or Paralympic sports so there's not the same generation of interest here and high proportion of Olympic medalists come from higher socioeconomic groups so you might want to be considering for example uh, the Team GB Olympic medalists and team. They're massively overrepresented by individuals that went to independent uh, sector schools. Now, I've got no comment to make about the uh, provision of state and independent sector schools, especially to this audience. But um, 
if we're getting a massive overrepresentation from one group, then there's a reason for that, right? And then we can start to maybe consider and address those reasons. Okay, question. In 2018, Sky, uh, Sky BT Sport, Amazon, BBC Sport agreed to de a deal worth £4.7 billion pounds for rights to the Premier League. Explain how increased costs affect spectators of the sport. So subscription costs to beat it to Sky or BT Sport go up, becomes too expensive to afford, but there's the, be the uh, benefit of better quality performances and the broadcasts are more regular. So folks, what we're saying here is, next, I have to explain how, but notice here, it can be good or bad, or it is good and bad. So we've got the opportunity here to give both good and bad to this particular circumstance. Um, next point, I'm gonna keep going here, changing media coverage since 1980. What's what's happened with that changing media coverage? So um, I'll tell you what folks, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I, I sort of start there, I'm just gonna take a, just take a break. Since 1980, coverage has changed around sport, and we're interested in that in the form of TV, radio, and the written press. So what are those changes? Let's do TV first, where probably the changes have been greatest. First of all, there's just more of it on TV, way more sport. Anyone who's roughly the same age as me, I'm in my mid-40s, my God, you had to wait a long time to see something like a football match or a rugby match. Who remembers grandstand on a Saturday? How good was that? Uh, anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Greater use of technology to present sport as entertainment. So we get more technology, more entertainment. We get less elite sport on free-to-air TV, so less and less top-level sport is visible without uh, subscription. Increased options for viewers, that's positive, right? Some sports protected and only available on free to air. So, so the World Cup, the Olympics have to be on the BBC and ITV because that's free to air, albeit you know you pay via watching adverts on ITV and you pay by your license fee on BBC, at least at the point where I do the session. Introduction of satellite and digital TV. I actually remember Sky coming into being the first time ever. We didn't have it to start with, but I remember that back in the 90s. What was it, 90? Two and I can one. I got, for, but I remember that happening. I remember seeing a satellite dish on someone's house for the first time. Um, massive growth in viewing options, subscriptions needed for elite sports such as Sky BT Sport. I have both of these, a bit embarrassing, isn't it? Really, pay per view for major events such as boxing. Think about uh, Tyson Fury, think about Mayweather fighting <laughs> at least one of the Paul brothers, <laughs> almost both. Um, think about. Uh, your MMA, think about in recent past McGregor, or think about who if I watched recently, Rose Nama Yunus and Carlo Esparza, or whoever happens to be in MMA, these sort of pay-per-view events are, are, are really, obviously it's part of the experience these days. Integration of social media into TV viewing experience. You watch, but you're online on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, commenting and a massive increase in sponsorship, uh, sponsorship especially gambling and alcohol. Of course, tobacco is banned from advertising of all kinds in the UK and certainly sports advertising. But that was a thing in the past as well. Again, I remember so clearly Formula One cars covered <laughs> covered in cigarette advertising. It seems bizarre to think about it now, but it was the case. Now, radio's changed too. It went from analog to what's available now, which is DAB, which of course is digital. We've got dedicated sports st uh, stations like TalkSport or Radio 5 Live. Although Radio 5 Live is also news, my favourite station. Local radio providing live coverage of local sports. So this is how things have changed. We've got much more availability. But I'll just add into here, you've also got world radio. In our house, we're, we're a multinationality household in our house. Uh, I'm the only British person living in our household. And we listen to a lot of world radio, okay, from people's homes. And my partner, Marta, is sat next to me. She's... Uh, Catalan Spanish woman, so of course we listen to Catalan radio quite a bit and what have you. But you know, this is a big change. I can listen to the local radio uh, to, to FC Barcelona's basketball matches, no problem at all. Um, anyway, written press, we're thinking newspapers, magazines, decline in physical newspaper value. So physical newspapers are selling less and less and less and less. Only offers extremely popular, oh, sorry, online offers extremely popular. So think about your Sky Sports homepage, your BBC Sports homepage, there we go, examples. But magazine subscriptions are still really positive. Again, some of them in the format of digital, but others in the format of physical. These remain very, very popular. There's something about people having it in their hand. They still want that. Now, I think I've got to change the tablet here, but I'll be, uh, yeah, change the tablet, Ch change the tablet, change the canvas. 
okay, we are getting there, but actually there's still a huge amount to do. So I hope I haven't conned you with that statement. We're now looking at the effects of the media on individual sports. So obviously, pre previously we looked at commercialization effects. Now we're looking at media effects. You must be prepared to differentiate those two in your mind. We're going to cover commercialization as a concept in a second. But the media, of course, is our TV, our radio, our written press. That's what we're talking about. So how does it have a positive effect on sports? Lots of overlap with commercialization, but new formats, entertaining, more of it, international, wealthier players, household names, bigger audience. These are all factors that are positive from the media. Better technology for officiating. Think about officiating technology, folks. Almost all of it comes through the media, right? It's almost all TV-based or microphone-based or replay-based, whatever it happens to be. Um, increased TV revenue can be invested. Better player wages. Better development of player. Better facilities. And the player gets better. All of that is positive for the sport, of course, by having the media engaged in the sport. Now, again, we've got that sort of exclusivity notion. Might not be for all. But where's it negative? We lose who we were in the past. Some people see that as positive. Some people see that as negative. We lose or have less value for, let's say, Test cricket. I think is an excellent example. Now, I actually think Test cricket in England and Wales um, is actually still pretty popular. But in other countries, you, you compare uh, the IPL Indian Premier League cricket to India um, as a Test playing nation, the IPL is far more powerful. And there's a good there's a good doc uh, documentary about that on Netflix. What's it called? I'm going to say it's called The Gentleman's Game. I'll check that and confirm that because I might have the wrong title, but it's actually worth watching. It's quite quite a simple documentary, but it's interesting. Little media interest, minority women's Paralympic sport, sensational item of sport. Basically, sport becomes clickbait, doesn't it? Ronaldo did so and so, Messi's in court. Um, I can't think of another example, but you get the point. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the ones that jumps to my mind about clickbait is when people answer questions. And they given a, a sports person might ask, answer a question that a journalist asked them, and they answer it honestly, and it might be, it might have a tinge of controversy in it, and that is the only thing that people focus on. Now, obviously, you should be careful what you say, but you know I think that's an interesting point. Hyping up rivalries, people watch TV rather than in the stadium, so we get smaller audiences live. That is because why would you go out in the rain and the cold in the winter when you can watch it on the TV? with a glass of cocoa in your hands or equivalent with something cold and fizzy. It makes fans consumers. It makes people reliant on the media. We get inequality of sports clubs. Only the wealthiest can do well. And the media begin to control, especially things like schedules. And you'll hear numerous people complain about that if you listen and watch listen to or watch enough sport. But the media has an effect on the, spot, on the performers themselves too. What is it? Better income. Can be full-time. Better earning potential. Famous. Role models. These are all positives. Uh, sponsorship option, image rights, training facilities get better, work with the world's best coaches. I mean, there's loads of experience, loads of examples of this. Uh, Team GB, uh, Olympic, obviously preparation by UK Sport, they've brought in lots and lots of the world's best coaches to come and work with British athletes. But there's negatives to the athletes. Loss of privacy. They're accountable in the public eye. They get abuse on social media, bless them. They get increased pressure on performance. Think about being watched and slow motioned on every single thing that you do. Every error can be highlighted. You get l less rest time. This can lead to things like injuries and uh, stress fractures and overtraining injuries and the pressure to play when injured, which we've kind of mentioned just a moment ago. But the media has an effect on spectators. Now let's go to the, let's, let's do the negative first. Ooh, big difference. <laughs> um, TV subscriptions get more expensive. Boo. You can't afford to watch things. I've got to get rid of either Sky or BT. It's absolutely killing, killing me. I've got to get rid of it. I like my Champions League. I like my Premier League. I like my cricket. I like, can't bother with golf. Um, anyway, no offence to golfers. It's just I don't have time to watch that. That's never mind play. I used to play golf a lot. Um, but maybe I'll get back to it. Who knows? Anyway, don't know where I'm going with that. Coverage disrupted with non-stop adverts. I, I would say American football is a really good example of that. Become a consumer in one's own home. Think about this. You sat on your sofa. You've got your nan next to your equivalent. You're watching a bit of badminton or tennis or football. And all of a sudden, you're getting an advert for kitchen roll. That is weird, isn't it? That is weird. To be sat in your house, flat, whatever. And someone's selling your kitchen roll. They don't normally put that in the sport, do they? What do they normally sell? Gambling, online gab. It's weird. Anyway, I think it's weird. <laughs> and how much sport can disrupt life? I'm not going to name names. Some of you might even be listening to this because some of you... <laughs> some of, but I literally know people who have got divorced because someone is spending too much time watching. I'm, I'm going to leave that there just because I'm getting a bit close 
to comfort there. I mean, that can happen if someone gets completely obsessed by whatever, watching, following Chelsea all around Europe or whatever. You know, you can <laughs> cause problems, right? Anyway, on the positive, remember we are doing here for the spectator. Exciting formats, more entertaining, more of it, international, better play, seats are comfier. Beautiful. What's not to like about that? Here we are. Cheeky little 10 marker here. Look at what we've got. Men's 2020 tournament social media web pages such as Twitter experienced a huge volume of postings. Evaluate the impact, positives and negatives, of the internet on the sport of football. So what have we got? The internet is apps, social media and websites, AO1. Examples, Google and Instagram. Videos such as YouTube. Live performer streaming on things such as DAZN. Increase the range of access that spectators have around the sp the internet. Allows stakeholders such as the FA or Premier League to promote their news. Clubs can promote themselves. That's a really interesting point, isn't it? Promote oneself. There's some really interesting examples of this in the sporting world. I, I, I quite like my combat sports, quite like my football. Um, I don't want to talk about I I want to mention this guy. Oh, come on, let's do it. You look at someone like Jake Paul, who I know is derided for all kinds of stuff, and perhaps deservedly so, but my God, he's making money in the sport of boxing. And you've got to respect that because he's built an audience and that audience is following him in this sport where he can make that audience effectively pay him for things. Players can build social networks and boost their career. We've got Rashford and the campaigns that he ran for Free School Miles. But there are issues. Now to the negative, the other side. Performers can receive hate. Traditional organisations like the FA are sort of too slow to realise the impact of the internet and they, cut and they struggle to catch up. Once they achieve this, can run all their campaigns this way, include anti-discrimination. This can grow rapidly. Think about how many times that the message rightly of anti-racism or equality, is, uh, that is for equality, not anti-equality, for equality has been spread in the media and, and especially the internet. It's been really good for spreading those messages. Finally, the internet has allowed players and clubs to provide their own side of the story and portraying themselves in a positive light and their messages are globalised. There's a really, really, really interesting evaluative answer there. Now, I'm going to criticise this answer because I don't think it provides a conclusion. Remember, you can always give a conclusion, especially to evaluate. Ideally, you will reach a judgment about whether it's overall positive or negative, so I'd encourage you to do that. Okay, we're very nearly there. The golden triangle, folks. What is it? It is the commercial relationship between elite level sport sponsors and the media. Okay, It is a relation. Now, I want to pick out some points here. First of all, it's commercial. This means the relationship is for profit. And can I be clear? All three parties involved are there for profit. We, we tend to think the sponsors, they mean no, all three. The other point I want to draw out here is this model works because the sport is elite. Okay, You could even add the word popular into that elite and popular sport. We know it works for things like football, golf, tennis. Maybe it doesn't work so well with something like, what should I choose, badminton. But we've got elite level sport, sponsors and media companies. Let's have a look at the actual relationship. What have we got here? So we've got the top level sport. We've got a popular sport. Let's use our men's football as our example. And let's use our Premier League or our Champions League. What happens there is the elite sport sell, let's say the Premier League, it sells the rights to the media company. And the media company, as we saw, spends potentially billions of pounds, spends that on the elite sport to be able to broadcast that coverage. Meanwhile, the sponsors can then pay into the media company and can then pay the elite sport for the right to actually advertise and sponsor through the media coverage that's going to be then witnessed on whatever it's the TV channel or whatever it happens to be. That becomes profitable. So look what we get. This receives profit. These sell subscriptions and make profits. Sponsorship sell their ad uh, buy advertising space and they sell their products better and link to healthy products and make profit. All three, and we often say it's this and this looking to make profit, but it's all three. Don't forget that about this. And you should have an opinion about whether that's positive or negative because that is what commercialization is. Commercialization is all three of these organizations making profit. And I remember what I said before, you as a fan, assuming you're not an elite performer for a second, if you are, forgive me, you as a fan become the consumer because what do you consume? You consume the advert via the media and that's because you have a love for that elite sport and that's how you're sold to. Okay, 
Uh, I'm going to go just straight through to this modern technology and sport to finish off. Now, I must give Marta a bit of a shout out here. I asked her to make this image for me. And obviously, she could have just made like a spider image for me. I said, I'll make it look a bit sciencey, Marta. Come on, girl. Give me a bit of something back. And she's come up with this. So I really appreciate the effort. I hope it's a nice image for you. Um, what have we got? What is the impact of technology on elite performance? So again, this ties into the media, actually. So what do we get? We get anthropometry. This is the physiological measurement, can be psychological, of athletes, their wingspan, their, uh, their muscle girth, their height, their weight, their fat percentage. We are measuring these things and we can use that to screen. Screening is a very powerful thing. That gives us the possibility of injury diagnosis. Um, and also prediction, MRI scanners can be incorporated to give very accurate representations of injuries. Injury treatments such as ultrasound, hydrotherapy, I could have gone on say cryotherapy uh, as a really interesting example of that as well. We get enhanced training aids, hypoxic chambers. You guys have studied IHT, intermittent hypoxic training. We tend to talk about it as a face mask, don't we, in physiological, uh, what they called uh, physiological clinic aids, if I got that right, I think I have. But also you can have a hypoxic chamber where you're actually effectively altitude, but in reality you're in Swanage or Slough or Staines or what else, or Sunderland or Swansea. <laughs> Where's this coming from? Um, but you can be at altitude because you've got this hypoxic chamber. We get simulated competitions, so surf simulators, bobsleigh tracks. We can make that technology of that facility so it's more realistic. Think about especially snow sports or winter sports. It's quite hard in the UK unless you're, unless, you're, unless you're in the highlands of Scotland or very occasionally in the Lake District, for example. Doesn't, you don't get enough snow in the Lake District to ski. Improved equipment, so we get high-tech, lighter, more aerodynamic. Can I also say that this is really in good, for, good for inclusion as well? So think about things like blades. Think about things like chairs, making sport more accessible at the elite level to more athletes of a different nature, for want of a better phrase. We get player monitoring, performance evaluation, tracking every performer now in every elite level professional sport is carrying a tracker usually between their shoulder blades, right? And we can monitor and follow. And we get sports science, biomechanics analysis, physiological testing, video analysis, side by side, overlay, frame by frame, 60 FPS, 120 FPS. If you don't know what FPS is, frames per second is video quality, meaning we can break down the performance even more. And finally, folks, the impact of technology on general participation. Now, your example that OCR have published, you are going to have questions on the impact of technology on general participation and on elite performance so that's why we're covering these areas so we've got here six overarching areas you might want to sort of get your own research done to develop these we've got accessibility is improved more people can access so hoists ramps are examples more motivation information and feedback think about your strava app i've got it there uh think or whatever health app you use think about your pedometers that incentivize you to keep active and to keep going you get progress or enjoyment. Some technologies make learning new skills more fun, so we know which stage we are. It might even be gamified. I used to do a running app. What was it called? Um, it's like Run Zombie Run or something. And wherever you were running around the streets, it would tell you there was, a, there was a load of zombies just on your shoulder coming around the corner. You just have to speed up to get away from them. It's a bit weird, really, but it, it certainly gamified and incentivized me to keep running. Um, it can operate with the notion of inclusion that obviously links quite closely to accessibility disabled participants can take part more with more uh, blades adapted wheelchairs etc also adapted sports there's more opportunity sports can be played in all weathers 4g pitches means that cancellations don't happen the drainage means that we don't get waterlogged pitches so much as we used to that varies from place to place and mass production of sporting equipment giving access to many to more people at affordable prices whether that's tennis rackets um whether that's scooters, uh, whether that's rollerblades or skateboards. I mean, use your own examples, but that technology is in the hands of more people, not least because we've got a smartphone in our hands and we can app things all the time, but mass production of equipment as well. I'm just thinking about things that I've got now that I wouldn't have had in the past. Yeah, carbon fiber tennis racket is a really good example. Lightweight badminton, I play quite a lot of badminton. Um, what else? I don't know why, but I can't think of any more <laughs> examples right now. You get my point. Uh, so this is the impact on general participation. And can I just stress to you, these key headings I think will really serve you well, really well. So try and get those in to your answer and try and make sure that you can give an example of each, even though I just struggled to do that with <laughs> the one I just gave. 
So, six mark question. Pretty substantial. The table shows the numbers attending the gym in the UK since 2015. Using the table, analyze the role technology has played in increasing participation numbers. So what's it done? It's gone up, we've got that from the graph. We're, we're taking some numbers from the graph and say specifically what they are. The increased trend is also steady. So when you get okay, an analyze question, especially when it's tabular graphical data, give the numbers from the table as a trend in your answer, we'll get you marks. This can, this, um, this is, there's been an increase in health awareness because of health apps. There's been an increase in the quality of gym equipment. There's more modern machines can guide the correct movement and people with disabilities have better access to the gyms and classes. So two points I wanna make there. Because I've got data, I've included the data and I've taken my points above from those six headings and I've included them into my answer here, getting with my six marks. There's other points in the mark scheme which you can obviously have a look at and dwell on yourselves. Uh, describe two ways in which technology can help to identify elite athletes. Anthropometry we covered. Oh, I should have given an example. Bone density measurement. I didn't mention this one. That's one example. And it could measure internal body fat. So some nice examples for AO2 there for you of where that would happen. Okay. So some nice examples for you to incorporate into your responses. I think we're done. And we are done. Well, I'm done. That's tw 20 shows in May. I'm pretty happy with that. That is going to be a little bit of a rest coming up tonight. After that. But anyway, these students are still revising. So do we have any, do we have any questions, yes. Martin? First question, how would commentators use technology within sport? Mm. Interesting question. Um, so first things first, two, two points before I maybe give that uh, question a, a go at answering. So first of all, the AI, not the only thing on the paper, of course, but the AI specifically mentions the impact of technology on general participation and on elite performance. So just be aware of that. It's not necessarily, we're not expecting a higher tariff question on things like spectatorship and certainly not on um, commentary, but I do find it an interesting question. So technology would, would, would uh, influence in the sense that, I guess tr more traditional commentary you wouldn't have in front of you immediate um, instant replays, for example. So if you're commentating on a rugby match, you wouldn't necessarily have previously access to see what actually happened in that moment, whether it was a knock-on or an offside or whatever, or if the ball was grounded. So that would uh, be one. Secondly, you, you talk about communication advances, so quality of microphones, quality of um, communication. But I'd also say the other thing we might say is you might be you might be um, broadcasting to a broader audience because effectively technology is going to be linked with that kind of globalization uh, concept as well so therefore you might have to be more culturally aware and more culturally sensitive um, what might be sort of typical expected language in one area might be quite different to another so that would be more of a nuanced point I'd also say as well that the the commentators would get access to more supportive technology other than instant replays as well think about in your cricket they would get access to things like heat maps, SNCO, statistics. All this would provide uh, additional research-based factual information for you then to present to your audience, essentially. But I would want to repeat that point. We do not expect a question on the impact of technology or media or commercialization, specifically on commentators or pundits. That, that would maybe be an extension of spectatorship or an extension of the sport, I suppose. But it's an interesting question, so I'm happy to answer that one. Mm -hmm. And do you think that Paralympic athletes should compete in the Olympics if they reach the qualifying yeah. criteria? Yeah, I do. Um, this is, I, I, if I would give an emphatic yes to that. Um, so linking to technology there, talk about potential the development of blades. Now, he who can never really be mentioned these days, Oscar, Oscar Pistorius, of course, did exactly this. Marty, you and I saw um, Ala Davies, the shot putter mm. throwing the Paralympics. Ala Davies, for a long time, was the top performing British shot putter, Paralympic or Olympic. And he got very, very close to the Olympic qualifying distance. Um, so it's an interesting sort of ethical question to ask oneself if technology allows for a Paralympic athlete to perform at equivalent or better levels than the average elite performer, uh, able body physical performer, how do we perceive that? Now, I would personally argue there is that shouldn't be a limitation. We have no issue anymore with other forms of enhancement of performance outside of the illegal ones. We're happy for people to, to, to train and improve themselves. We're happy, for example, um, for individuals to take supplements. We're happy for individuals uh, so, you know, we, we don't categorize sprinters by 
their height. We've got examples like Usain Bolt, who genetically was quite different to a lot of athletes. We, we don't have any issue with that. So I would argue that, um, yeah, Paralympic athletes certainly should be allowed to compete in the Olympics if they attain the qualifying standard. One word of caution on that, though, I'd say is that if, if a, a technology was developed which put... Um, uh, let's say a blade, a bladed runner, way out in front of any potential non-bladed runner, then that technology would have to be managed. And we got a good example of that in swimming. We had the development of the laser suits, which were now illegal, and every world record. I'm going to say it was around about 2006, seven, and every world record was smashed by these people wearing these laser suits, L A Z R, and the reason that they thought. The reason that the records were being broken so easily is it produced a little air pocket just above the spine, which helped the tiny bit of flotation, raised, reduced drag in the water. And those records still stand today, but they've got a little asterisk next to them. Um, so we can effectively manage and maintain um, the level at which something like blades could support an athlete so it wouldn't be grossly unfair in that advantage if that if it came to that. But we're not at that point at this point. We're some way off that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that would be my answer to that one. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Another question from another student. Mm -hmm. what, <laughs> one, one question that you're going to love, I'm sure. What synoptic questions do you think are likely? Oof. <laughs> I have already preempted on the on the answer saying, look, I'll pass it on, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm happy to say things such as what we've covered today is really possible as a synoptic question combined with, uh, on a 10 marker, um, with material from sports society i'm very happy to to make that prediction i'm very very cautious to say that it's going to be our 10 marker that we've put in the practice paper for example i think i think that it's really dubious if i do that and it's probably going to be very very misleading for you and i think i could potentially do you more harm than good um for example we had the gcc paper ones today and the students are really happy with the support that we provide around that paper, but ultimately the nine, the sixes, the nine mark questions, the extended writing, they're different to the ones that we put out or the ones that we kind of projected. So I'm really cautious to say it's going to be this or that. Um, if you consider as well that Sport in Society was the entire section named in the AI, it's, it's hard to to be um, to be really specific about that. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'd be really cautious to... I certainly wouldn't make a prediction. Exactly. So, um, and I would say the key phrase is learn everything and overlearn the AI material. That's mm -hmm. the key phrase. The only other point I'd add there is get really familiar with the infographics that we've released. They're really useful for you to for, to see the nature of what the assessment's going to likely be for you, for you guys on, on on paper three, as it would be for paper two and paper one in those examples as well. So that would be my guidance, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another question from another student. What would be the best example for someone to use when addressing illegal drug doping? The best example for a legal drug, I mean, there's so many. Steroids is considered, anabolic steroids are considered to be the granddaddy of, of cheating, really, by drugs. So, I mean, I guess that would be the best example. And if you want to give uh, a particular example of that, I would say the best example, although it's not necessarily the drug he's best known for, would be Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong used anabolic steroids as a recovery drug, and it helped him in, in recovery. So I'd say that would be a really good example. The other one would be EPO. Again, I would be naming the cyclist there. Lance Armstrong, <laughs> top of the list. Um, other really high profile um, sort of drug cases, um, you could think about people like uh, Dwayne Chambers and THG, tetrahydrogestrinone. Uh, you could look at the, um, uh, the, the Rosada, the Russian laboratory that was breaking into its own lab, had holes in the wall and was swapping out dirty urine for clean urine. I think that's a really contemporary good example. The Icarus that documentary is really good for detailing that one. Um, you could talk about Marion Jones, who was ultimately found guilty of perjury and sent to prison because she lied un in deposition um, about her use of uh, performance-enhancing drugs. I mean, these are all really, really good examples. There was one. There's one that's just happened in the UK, and I was listening to about it last night, and it was Richard Keelty, uh, who won a silver medal at the World Championships, I think, for. Um, uh, for relay sprinting, relay 100 meters, and he, I, I, I want to make sure I've got the right person here, but I, I believe that the medal was stripped from those guys, and that was an anabolic steroid. So that would be a very, very contemporary example. Just, just fact check me on that last one because I literally heard it on the radio yesterday. So just fact check that one that I've got the right individual, the right way around. And I know CJ Uju was being criticised for supporting, I think Richard Kilty, but anyway, just check that one. So I hope that's okay, Martin. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Um, and last question, you mm -hmm. mentioned cryotherapy. Mm -hmm. What is cryotherapy? Okay, so cryotherapy is an alternative, far more expensive alternative to something like an ice bath. And the way cryotherapy works is you go into a holding chamber. Think about it like the opposite of a sauna, but you go or a steam room. You go into like a chamber. It's in a very cold temperature, usually around about minus 50, 50 degrees. You're held in that um, holding chamber for a small period of time, so usually around about a minute. Then you go into the, the, the cold chamber. In the cold chamber, it can be as low as a, minus 170 degrees. Now, the way that works, you're only in there for seconds, less than a minute. The way that works is when you're exposed to that level of cold, and of course, you've got to wear a mask to protect your lips, you wear pads, you wear a hat. When you're ex exposed to that level of cold, your blood is shunted to the very center of your body, to the core of the body. So when you come out of that cold about a minute later, blood will be then redistributed back around to your skin, back around to your skeletal muscle, and it effectively flushes through that blood back, pumps that blood back through the muscle tissue. And it's good for cleansing out toxins, cleansing out waste. And what it tends to do is it tends to uh, reduce DOMS, re reduce inflammation, and it's really good for um, for recovering faster, after, especially after highly competitive performances. So that's what we mean by cryotherapy. On the positive side, it's effective. On the negative side, it's very expensive. Not everyone knows how to do it. It's extremely cold and uncomfortable. You can experience uh, cold burns and things like this. So yeah, that's what cryotherapy is, Marta. Amazing. Are we okay? Yes. All right. Well, look, we we uh, I feel bad for what I'm going to say here because you lot are probably under the gun right now, like pushing really hard in your exams. We're sort of relieved because we've done 20 revision sessions in about 20 days. So we're, March and I um, are due for a bit of a rest. So I hope it's okay to say that. I want to thank all the teachers and all the students for participating in these sessions. I also want to make a particular thank you to Marta because if you look at all those documents, infographics, um, notes, pages, you know, a lot of the time I just turn up and show off and teach and do that sort of thing. A lot of the legwork, the imagery especially, is done by Marta in the background. And I just wanted to mention that. So if you're learning from... If you find yourself memorizing these little spider images or evaluative images or side-by-side -side tables, the person who's made those nice, pretty, color-coordinated, balanced information is Martha. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. You're very Because well. you, you make my life pretty easy to be able to say. <laughs> uh, so yeah, just wanted to credit that. And um, with all that understood, we'll, we'll, we'll sing you out. Not literally, you wouldn't want that. And we'll wish you guys the very best. We're available to you via social media. If you have questions, post them on the, on the, the YouTube channel. If you want to come to the platform, we've got a live chat during the day that you can go into there as well. And finally, obviously, we're always available on, on, the, on the broad social media uh, platform. So do get in touch if you've got any questions. We will answer you and we will give you the best answer that we can do. Good luck on Thursday for paper one and paper two, paper three after half term, right? I should know the dates, they're here. Hang on. So everyone's got them. Paper two on Friday 10th of June and then paper three right at the end on the, tw on the Tuesday the 21st. So there you go. All the best, folks. I really hope it goes well for you. Take care.